Well, our subject this afternoon is uh, cannabis, uh, a subject which is of interest to large numbers of people, though it's rarely discussed and in fact seems to have attained the status of somewhat of a taboo in polite society. My interest in it is uh, intense and lifelong, I must say. Uh, I remember uh, when I first encountered it, within a few minutes of my first exposure to it, I realized that I was going to be able to self-medicate myself to normalcy. Uh, I was, as an adolescent, what's called a nervous child uh, and uh, sort of uh, had a personal style that was very hard driving and I'm told fairly abrasive and uh, it really came with the force of a revelation that uh, the mere smoking of a small amount of vegetable material could completely invert the structures of my personality and uh, socialize me, as it were, into a reasonably functioning member of the community in which I found myself. I first encountered cannabis in Berkeley in the uh, Easter vacation of 1965 and it took a, a, a couple or three exposures to it before I really sorted out what it was doing for me and uh, I brought to it all the uh, programming that my middle-class straight parents had given me concerning the subject, that this was uh, the weed of death, that the road to hell was paved uh, with this particular substance. But I also had been exposed to some of the literature of the Beat Generation, the writings of Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, uh, and uh, some of those people. And uh, within just a few months, I had integrated it into my lifestyle uh, as uh, really the central practice of my life. And it has remained so up until just two or three months ago, when under the pressure of my apparently dissolving marriage, I uh, stopped smoking uh, in order to see, really, what sort of effect it would have. I was in the sort of absurd position of being in uh, psychotherapy with a woman who I respected very much and who seemed to be a very skilled psychotherapist except that she had no sophistication whatsoever about cannabis and the therapeutic process kept looping back to the issue of my cannabis ingestion and she would ask me well now how many times a day do you do this I would say uh, 10 to 14, and she would say, and how many years have you been doing this? Well, 25, 26, 27, and finally I saw that it was impeding the therapeutic process, not in in its physical effects, but in its effects on her attitude toward me. So I determined simply to stop in order to remove this issue from uh, the menu of issues that we were dealing with in this therapeutic process. And I'm happy to report that uh, though I was at that time the heaviest and most continuous cannabis user I have ever known or heard of, uh, it was no big deal. I simply stopped smoking it and uh, took up reading in the evenings 
and uh, it seemed to have no uh, impact on my psychological organization at all, except that, I must say, um, my dream life became uh, considerably more interesting in the wake of that decision. And over the years in my traveling, when there have been times when for just a few days my access to cannabis was interrupted, I noticed this same phenomenon, that in the absence of cannabis, the dream life seems to become much richer. This causes me to sort of uh, form a, a theory just for my own edification, that cannabis must in some sense um, uh, thin the boundary between the conscious and unconscious mind. And I sort of imagine uh, the, the unconscious as a system under hydraulic pressure. And if you smoke cannabis, the energy which would normally be channeled into dreams uh, is instead manifest in the reveries uh, of the cannabis intoxication. The reason that I've smoked it so assiduously over the years is very simply that it seems to dissolve uh, a local and personalistic perspective. If I don't smoke cannabis, I worry about balancing my checkbook, uh, the state of my uh, immediate short-term uh, career concerns. In other words, all the anxieties of the petty bourgeois pour in to claim my attention. If, on the other hand, I avail myself of cannabis, I'm able to rove and scan through a vast intellectual world that is composed of uh, all the books I've ever read, all the people I've ever known, all the places I've ever been, in no particular order. I and mean, what I really value about cannabis is the way in which it allows one to be taken by surprise by unexpected ideas. In the absence of cannabis, my creativity is a kind of brick-by-brick, brick, linear extrapolation of certain concerns based on what I've just read or heard in conversation. If, on the other hand, I smoke cannabis, I can go in one moment from thinking about Goethe's color theory to in the next moment puzzling over a particular instance in Mayan historiography or, uh, well, the, the examples are endless. And I think um, that my experience is generalizable specifically by looking at, for instance, the architectural and art historical motifs of uh, areas of the world where cannabis has been institutionalized for thousands of years, what we call oriental extravagance is in fact the patina of design motifs and literary conventions that have been laid over ordinary experience in places like Bengal, uh, the Punjab, and across the, the Middle East. Uh, Islam is a civilization, to my mind, largely, though perhaps unconsciously, under the influence of uh, the visions and the attitudes imparted by hashish. Uh, when I attempt to analyze, uh, in, a, in the broadest sense, what can, the influence that cannabis has on myself and on large groups of people who use it, it is uh, that it seems to exert uh, a kind of feminizing 
influence. It's a boundary dissolving drug, but a very gentle boundary dissolving drug. It doesn't dissolve boundaries in the spectacular way that the mega hallucinogens do. Of all the drugs that have been used by mankind over the centuries, I would venture to argue that cannabis is the most benign. Certainly, more money has been spent trying to uh, find something wrong with cannabis than has ever been spent on any other drug and the findings are uh, woeful uh, 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 well there's just no support for the idea that cannabis is anything other than as benign as a drug can be when you consider that it has to be smoked so there is the issue of the generation of tars now it is true that in India charas which is what is smoked uh, as the equivalent of hashish, is actually a much more complex material. Charas can, often contains opium, nearly always contains uh, datura, uh, parts of the datura plant which contain tropane alkaloids, and it usually is held together by resin binders from various varieties of pine trees. Uh, nevertheless, apparently, uh, the smoking of charas in India is also an extremely non-destructive habit. Uh, alcohol, on the other hand, is demonstrably one of the most destructive of all social habits. I mean, I think what a bright world it would be if every alcoholic were a pothead. What a bright world it would be if uh, every user and abuser of speed and caffeine were a pothead. It seems to be a, uh, a plant which has evolved in a very intimate association with human beings from a very early time, and hence whatever deleterious effects it has, we have managed to accommodate ourselves to them very well. Uh, one of the most interesting things about cannabis as a cultural phenomenon, I think, is, um, first of all, notice how uh, cannabis is the resin product of the hemp plant. The hemp plant is, since the Neolithic forward, the um, uh, preferred source of fiber and cordage. And I think it's interesting to note how uh, the language of story and the, lang and the technical language of weaving are very, very similar. In other words, we untangle a, a, a narrative, we weave a story lies are made of whole cloth. All of these words which describe uh, the use of fibrous materials are also the words that we use for uh, storytelling and narrative. And I think it's because probably these two concerns, weaving and uh, storytelling and linguistic facility, go back and find themselves in congruence in the hemp plant. The other thing that's interesting is that um, the, in the cultivation of hemp for resin purposes, for drug production purposes, all the emphasis falls upon the female plant. The male plant does not produce a usable drug material. And in fact, female plants, if in the presence of male plants, uh, become contaminated with male pollen and then produce an inferior drug product. So hemp it, it literally demands the honoring 
of the female. Now, I'm not suggesting that this was consciously in the minds of primitive people because the female hemp plant does not particularly appear female in any way that can be associated to human femaleness. But it is nevertheless true that hemp plants come in two very distinct forms, and we now know that one of these forms is the expression of the male plant, the other is the expression of the female plant. So waves of Gylanic resurgence uh, that have been coming and going since the Neolithic uh, seem to me in many cases to carry along as one of the appurtenances of the Gylanic sensibility uh, devotion to this particular drug and this particular plant uh, above all others. Anybody want to jump in here? Well, <clears throat> only a small question mm -hmm. to start with. Um, since the leaves of the male plant do have a pharmacological effect, um, I just wondered if you had anything to say on your experience of comparing the effects of the two. Well, only in that if it has a pharmacological effect, its orders of magnitude more weakened than the female. Uh, one thing I might say, we in the 20th century tend to smoke our cannabis. I mean, aside for the occasional holiday cannabis cookie, uh, cannabis for us is something that is smoked. On the other hand, for the 19th century and for all of European civilization, uh, cannabis was something uh, that was eaten in the form of various sugared confections that were prepared and this method of ingestion changes cannabis into an extremely powerful psychedelic experience I mean if you read the accounts of people like uh, uh, Theodore Gautier or Baudelaire or Fitzhugh Ludlow written in the mid 19th century they are describing experiences that obviously were for them as powerful as a 500 microgram dose of LSD proved uh, in our own lifetimes. Uh, and we forget this. We tend to think of it as a social uh, as a social drug and a kind of a minor drug uh, on a par with smoking a cigarette or having a cognac or something like that. But in fact, for the serious eater, of hashish, there it is the portal into a true artificial paradise uh, whose length and breadth is equal to that of any of the artificial paradises that we've discovered in modern psychedelic pharmacology. To my mind, the whole of Orient, of, uh, by Oriental I mean Indian and Middle Eastern civilization, is steeped in the ambiance of hashish. I mean, the Mosque of Omar, for example, is a beautiful example of the aesthetic of hashish at work, or Jama Masjid in Delhi, or the... Um, interiors of the mosques of Isfahan, this ideal of sensual beauty, of the uh, richness of abstract design and vaulting spaces and uh, vast concourses of uh, polished marble and travertine, these seem to be uh, the motifs of hashish uh, in the same way that the Gothic vision of black ocean waters sucking at haunted islands is a part of the repertoire of the opium vision that so entranced uh, the romantic poets. Hash hashish cannabis has an ambiance of its own. It has a morphogenetic field. And if you enter into that morphogenetic field, you enter into a, a, an androgynous, softened, abstract, colorful, uh, and extraordinarily beautiful world. 
And in our own time, it seems to me the uh, intense hatred and of hashish and the efforts to eradicate it that reach hysterical proportions in our own country have nothing to do with the pharmacological impact of the drug or any deleterious effect that it might be perceived to have, but rather it is sensed as the carrier of a different set of cultural values, which I would broadly describe as uh, Gaian or Gailanic or feminizing or androgynous, and that this is what really brings the opprobrium of the dominator society upon it. It is profoundly disloyal to the values of uh, modern industrialism where, for instance, a drug like caffeine, exemplified in coffee and tea, has been made very welcome in those same societies. I mean, no other drug other than caffeine has ever been written into the industrial contracts of workers as an inalienable right. And yet in the coffee break, we encounter uh, contractually uh, uh, defined rights to drug use that seem to work in favor of both manager and worker. Cannabis is very different. It promotes a dreaminess. It promotes an abiding in the imagination that is uh, the, the stuff of romantic poetry rather than the stuff of the modern assembly line. And I've used it that way as a tool for creativity. I mean, it's incredible how just a few puffs of cannabis can carry you over uh, uh, a creative problem or a block in seeing a particular problem so that suddenly the perspective shifts and what was previously occluded becomes patently obvious. So I think that there's a great argument for... Um, above and beyond the well-known and familiar arguments for legalizing this drug, that it would provide revenue for governments, that it would decriminalize a class of people who, if it weren't for their devotion to cannabis products, would be seen to be among the most law-abiding of all classes within society. These arguments are familiar and have been made uh, very eloquently by other people. But behind that, there's a deeper issue, which is the, the zeitgeist, if you will, of cannabis, which carries a certain... Uh, implied danger to establishment values which put such a premium on clear-eyed hard work and Presbyterian rectitude. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> well, I think it's interesting that in countries like Egypt and India, uh, where cannabis has been used for millennia, and accepted as part of society. But now, both under the influence of the United States foreign policy and of industrialism, there's now attempts to suppress or stamp it out. Countries like Malaya, where it's been <coughs> accepted as part of Kampong life for many, many generations, now there are strict laws, draconian attempts to uh, stop people smoking it. And and death death penalty. Even death penalties. So, it's true that there's a shift in valuation taking place, imposed by the West, going together with industrialism, which is happening, and it's clear that this is something to do with this change in consciousness. Um, it's also clear that the, um, in the 19th century there was a very different attitude on behalf of Western powers, and cannabis was not illegal in Western countries, and indeed in India. Um, the British government in India operated a cannabis monopoly. Um, the cannabis trade was the monopoly of the government, and this continued in parts of um, India, like United Uttar Pradesh and in Pakistan, until quite recently. Maybe it still goes on. But when I was last in Lahore, um, in the bazaar there, there's a, a, a little shop, which says over the door, government opium shop, 
and this shop deals in cannabis and um, opium and is uh, still or was still part of the government monopoly. So different attitudes have prevailed at different times but it's clear that the modern industrial consciousness is alien to cannabis and I suppose it's clear that the growth of what you'd call Guyan consciousness from the 1960s onwards um, is closely linked to it. Most people I know um, whose smoke it has started in the 1960s or subsequently, I know very few who were familiar with its use before then, there must always have been some, but it was presumably uh, the explosion of consciousness in the 1960s was closely associated with the explosion of cannabis and other psychedelic substances. Um, well, given all these facts, and given the strong case you make for its uh, benevolent effects, what I'm interested in is why Ralph, who was also present on the scene in the 1960s, is no uh, enemy of the effect of psychedelics, has um, spent so many years as a total abstainer. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you because I have an extremely positive attitude for cannabis. I personally made the acquaintance uh, in 1966, so a year after Terence, around my 30th birthday, and I discovered immediately on first smoking, more or less, some of these beneficial effects, even though I had no culture around me, um, um, mythological interpretation and, and uh, tradition of cannabis appreciation. Nevertheless, I saw uh, at once these functions of the deconstruction of character armor and uh, rigid mental structures opening up for a free roving enormous uh, terrains of intellectual territory, the synthetic uh, effect of a resonance between previously isolated rooms in the mental mansion. And uh, in uh, 1968, there came into my possession by some miracle a large amount of synthetic THC in caps, which I uh, circulated among friends, uh, many of whom were mathematicians. And this uh, oral ingestion does produce, uh, I guess, what a smoker of cannabis would call an overdose, basically, <laughs> and uh, a, a very, well, benign psychedelic experience. Then, after moving to Santa Cruz in 1968, where the hip subculture was thriving, all events were accompanied by smoking joints. And um, my main impression of it is what uh, Terence described on the relationship of hemp and uh, stories. Um, well, I've learned this word uh, diaphanous from you, Terence, thinking of triaphanous, the triaphanous web that we weave in our meetings, this um, kind of strong coupling, enhanced resonance was, in my experience, characteristic of the cannabis experience. So we started with the chant Om Namo Shivaya, and in India, the smoking of charas is a, uh, most commonly, it's a form of puja for Shiva. Daniel Ru has emphasized the history of the Shaivite religion as preceding the arrival of the Indo-Europeans, the Aryans, into India. It's associated with the, the Dravidians now living in the south of India. And he identifies also this uh, Shaivite religion, prehistoric religion, with Orphism in Greece. Shiva, Orpheus, this is the same. So the association of cannabis and uh, gyrony, I think, is a uh, very reasonable uh, conjecture on prehistory that uh, cannabis was an important crop in Minoan Crete, was an important
important ingredient in the Dionysian revels before alcohol took over. It was the uh, maybe the secret and most important in ingredient in the maintenance of the dynamic partnership societies of the prehistoric past. Therefore, the fact that its uh, arrival into mass use, breaking into mass use through college campuses in the 1960s, uh, did give birth to the hips of subculture, gave rebirth to the uh, to the Gylenic, uh resurgence wave, yet another Gylenic resurgence wave in the 60s. So this is the pretty powerful benefit for the uh, argument in favor of the free availability of cannabis in the society. It has uh, beneficial effects, which are not only a little bit beneficial as, for example, creativity, enhanced health, or something like that. It aids the diaphanous web, the communication, the empathy, the appreciation for another view, the possibility of resonance between one's ideas and other ideas, opening up um, creativity on the scale of cultural evolution in personal relationship, the way in which uh, sexual experience is enhanced, for example, the aphrodisiac effect of cannabis in the right dose. It's just one example of its overall uh, synthetic role. It is uh, medicine for cultural evolution, and th th that's my experience. But if you want to know why I stopped, I think, uh, well, during the time that I did make friends with cannabis, I was al also doing LSD a lot, and then mushrooms a lot, and other psychedelics, and so on. So it was like sort of a package deal. I found it uh, convenient, finally, to experience with the other side uh, an alternate behavior in which there would be a focusing on a tiny point of consciousness to a kind of focus <clears throat> and concentration maintained over a long period of time, which was, which brought its own benefit, another kind of benefit. So after synthesizing and um, deconstructing armor and obtaining new views over vaster territories and so on, if <clears throat> you want to produce a product, like proving a mathematical theorem, which sometimes takes seven years of concentration on a single point in consciousness, this um, kind of activity for, for me seemed to be enhanced by abstinence from everything, from newspapers, from other people's stories, from dinner party talk, and, and, and so on, and from large parts of my own consciousness, just focusing on a point. I found experimenting with every different variation of behavior and in order to accomplish my goals, say around 1980, when I quit all the uh, psychedelics for a while, uh, trying all these experiments and bringing the parameters, I found that the least of everything, indulging in a process in India they call sankratizing, uh, giving up everything and then bragging about that, this brought about more and more increase of the performance for myself that of speaking at that time. And this is like an elite athlete searching for ultimate performance, or trying to break some kind of world record for focusing on a point. It's even uh, what I was doing was difficult and <coughs> required rigid discipline. I invoked these ideas of yoga discipline that I had learned in, in India, and they're responsible for a certain kind of ultimate performance as uh, cannabis and other psychedelics enhance a completely different kind of ultimate performance. And I suppose this is, I guess you could say, another binary of a, a focusing and defocusing mental states. In my current state, now more than 10 years old, I, I realize is approaching the breaking point, and soon it may be also, it may be necessary for me to relax 
in a, on a fairly massive scale in order to um, regain novelty in my approach. Hmm. How does it work for you, Rupert, in the process of relating to the problem of creativity? Well, I think there are two uh, two things I'd say. One is that um, it seems to create a much greater sense of ability to concentrate. So contrary to your experience that concentration is easier without it, I found that um, one of the effects is a greatly enhanced ability to concentrate, whether it's listening to music, to concentrate on the music and not be distracted by other things, or whether it's um, reading something and thinking about the ideas and following a chain of thought to try concentrate on that, or a line of exploration and conversation. Um, or <coughs> um, in writing, to concentrate on the flow of thought and onto the expression of the words and the, the, the way in which the language can express the idea. The, the tremendous concentration that's required in writing something, at least which I find is necessary for writing books, um, or, or thinking out the structure of a chapter or of a, um, an argument. I find that it's a great aid to concentration, partly because, as Terence says, it makes it possible to enter a state where these become things of importance and it, it the everyday concerns about checkbooks, banks you know, mailing a letter this kind of thing becomes secondary importance um, so it may be partly by removing the niggling preoccupations of mundane existence that it becomes easier to concentrate the second effect I found, which uh, I have a great deal to thank the uh, cannabis plant for, is that in relation to places, the spirit of places, the spirit of trees, the spirits of plants, um, and the spirits of sacred places, two temples, cathedrals, and so on, that um, it gives an enormous enhancement of the sense of connection and relationship which is otherwise normally filtered out by this chattering internal dialogue of a banal kind which goes on much of the time. So that, uh, I suppose, would fit with what Terence says about the dissolution of boundaries. Um, so there's a, a much greater sense of connectedness. Um, but there are two, two other things that come in, in train with this. One, as Terence noted, a suppression of dreams. Whenever I, I'm not a, a constant smoker, and if I have the kind that you, you were, Terence, um, more sort of occasional. Um, but in periods when I don't smoke at all, then there's, I notice a much greater intensity of dreams. I remember more dreams. They seem much more vivid periods when I'm smoking, um, I don't remember dreams at all, usually. So there is this curious suppression of dreams, and I don't really know what to make of that. Um, there's also um, an effect which I think is a negative effect of cannabis, and which is one of the reasons why governments and industrial civilizations try to suppress it, which is that um, because it produces a kind of physical relaxation, which allows the mind to expand and journey and uh, one's psyche to connect and so on. Uh, this, I think, the other side of that coin is that there's a kind of toning down and, uh, and tuning down the whole springs of action of the body. So it's perfectly content to sit around doing not very much. Um, it doesn't produce a tremendous urge to go and enter the dustbin or um, you know, do chores around the house and, and that kind of thing. And indeed it's this um, kind of activity which is easily identified by external observers as physical laziness, which is the reason for its bad reputation in countries where it's habitually used. And in Kashmir, for example, I was staying in Srinagar at one stage, and I had an agricultural project in Srinagar, and I was staying with a friend who was studying Kashmiri Shaivism. So 
know, I have my job and then I was staying with this fellow and we were talking about this and he said, well, have you ever been to one of these shrines where, Sufi shrines, Durgas, where cannabis smoking is tolerated as part of the standard pattern of society, um, but where you see why there is a negative um, image of this hashish smoking in such societies which you also get in Egypt and so on. I mean, some of the middle-class image of cannabis smoking in India and in Malaya and elsewhere is a bit like the middle-class image of winos and, and methylated spirit drinkers and so on in, in the West. We went to the shrine, which was the shrine of a Sufi saint, and attached to it was a smoking room, and this room was full of people smoking hashish sitting around the walls, and there was a place there where you could buy it. So we sat down and had a puff, and I, it was a dreadful revelation to me when the man sitting next to me spoke to me in Urdu and um, he'd got bleary eyes, he'd got several days growth of stubble, he was in ragged smelly clothes. He pulled out a picture of himself, a kind of identity card thing, of himself smart in a uniform, he said I used to be a bus driver until I started smoking, now look at me, that's what it's done to me, he said as he took another puff. I've lost my family, I've lost everything. and. So there was a kind of uh, the negative, the shadow side of it, which I saw then more clearly than ever before or since, um, which certainly fitted with what rather prim middle class people in Malaya and India and in other oriental countries had told me about its habitual usages, which made it clear how it could accumulate this negative image, how it could um, cause alarm in people who don't want the habit to spread in modern, efficient industrial societies. Um, and this is certainly associated in my own experience with um, the fact that the mental expansion is bought at the price of a, um, a certain physical lethargy. So I wonder if that's been your experience. I, actually, it hasn't. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the question. It has to be said that cannabis is uh, chemically complicated. It's not simply one cannabinol. There are a number of these cannabinoids, and various strains are have various ratios and proportions of these things. But, for instance, I find when I'm writing books that I can only write for about three hours and then either the day is finished for work or I smoke hashish and 20 minutes later I'm ready to go two hours more at it and I can do that twice in a day if I judiciously control my intake of cannabis it like gives me a second wind and a third wind to go forward with creative activity. Now, if you just sit down and smoke into stupor, you're not going to be able to do this. But if you just stop this now tiresome and boring activity and have a couple of puffs, and then you sit and you have a few interesting thoughts and you feel completely revitalized and able to go back to it. And I've noticed this not only with creative work, but with physical work. For instance, if I'm stacking wood, I'll stack half a cord of wood and then I'll either think, well, I'll finish stacking it tomorrow and then I'll go in and smoke some cannabis. And a half hour later, I'll say, well, if I wait till tomorrow, I'll just go and finish it right now. I think you all know Paul Bowles' book, uh, or the statement that uh, a puff of Keith makes a man strong as 20 camels in the courtyard. There's something to this. It's, it's not simple. It can turn you into a stupor, sort of lazy, loutish person. On the other hand, it can allow you to do very hard work for very long periods of time. So you sort of have to manage it. And I think a lot of people don't learn to manage it. One of the things that's always put against uh, marijuana is that it destroys short-term or, or it destroys your memory well I dare say I have a prodigious memory 
and I'm the heaviest smoker I've ever known. And my memory for dates, names of painters, writers, literary and scientific minutia, odd vocabularies in specialized areas is very great. And I, I don't credit cannabis with that, but I certainly can't believe that it has damaged my ability to do this. Now, it is true that sometimes in a conversation you will lose your thread, but on the other hand, uh, it gives you an equal power to brilliantly fake the situation and to pick up the thread and re-stitch together um, the narrative. The other point I might make that we haven't mentioned yet, or two points actually, is that I think it gives an, in, uh, an extraordinary verbal facility. And this is actually what won me to it in the first place. Uh, my reputation as a public speaker is based on my supposedly dazzling oratorical abilities. But I come out of a, a peer group, a carass in Berkeley, where everyone was able to do what I do. Everyone seemed to be able to hold forth for hours on the most arcane subjects. And in fact, when I got into cannabis, the style of doing it that I enjoyed most was uh, I ran a kind of cannabis salon, as it were. And people came, and they smoked, and they talked, and talked, and talked. And this is all we did was talk. And I no recordings exist of that era, but I believe that the conversation was brilliant, wide-ranging, prescient, uh, to the point and extraordinarily uh, creative and capable of astonishing. And I give uh, complete credit to cannabis for that. I, I remember the second time that I smoked cannabis, um, I was a great fan of Herman Melville at that time. And uh, my friend and I smoked some cannabis and then called on some young women at a dormitory that we were courting at that time and we went into the visitor's room of the dormitory and I was able to hold forth for an hour in a pseudo Melvillian style I created on the spot without hesitation a, a, a short story in the style of Herman Melville uh, that was dazzling apparently to my hearers. Well, this, this is a verbal facility of an extraordinary sort. The other area where I think it has an important role to play that we haven't talked about is in uh, sexual performance and sexual stamina. Uh, when I first became sexually active, and I think this is a problem of many young men simply because they have so much juice going, is uh, uh, premature ejaculation. I, all my sexual encounters were haunted by that possibility simply because I was just so hyped up over the idea of having intercourse with someone. Well, I discovered that smoking hashish gave me an incredible ability to control my ejaculation and also uh, my sexual stamina. So these were invaluable social skills. It gave me a verbal facility, sexual stamina, control over my ejaculation, uh, beautiful visions, a prodigious memory. Uh, <laughs> it did everything but suppress appetite, which it certainly did not do. Uh, the munchies, uh, regardless of what pharmacologists tell us, 
about how this is an illusion, the munchies seem to be a very real part of cannabis use, meaning that 40 minutes or an hour after smoking cannabis, one does find oneself rummaging through the cupboard looking for uh, chocolate chip cookies. But uh, this, this is hardly grounds for hanging, which is the current uh, legal response in Malaysia. My impression, Terence, is that your experience is not typical, and uh, most of the things you described, I would say, are typical of my experience personally. And but, mine. Mm. But uh, in uh, Santa Cruz, I remember after the 60s came and went, and then there was, I mean, this is a community that was very involved in the marijuana trade in uh, the 70s, let's say. There were a certain number of people who were habitual users, I, I would say, habitual smokers, as you were, and it seemed as if they couldn't get their life together. Unlike you, they were, you know, they were functional, they could stack the wood, but they never got on to doing what they wanted to do, and I did begin to associate a certain subtle disorganization with their habitual smoking. Um, this is a different, a, a slightly more mild form of this negative effect of, of, that Rupert described in India where, where people are um, truly a addicted and in a subhuman state. That I think requires taking a really uh, deep inhalations of cannabis with, with, a, with a chill on. But um, there are, let's say, for the sake of discussion, that there is a negative side beyond what you have experienced in case of uh, heavy use. And even so, it's, I think, very modest compared to the negative side of heavy use of alcohol and is very insignificant in comparison with the very positive effects of cannabis use in a society which in the case of alcohol, I don't know of any. There might be, some people can tell amazing alcohol stories where they really have been able to work wonderful while intoxicated, but basically I think it's agreed that uh, while relaxing and in small doses isn't good for your health, it basically has a negative influence. It brings up the question that I know you've uh, both thought about this, why is it, how is it that uh, cannabis, in spite of these beneficial effects, its benignness and so on, is so strongly uh, regulated and forbidden all over the planet now? One idea I know from the previous, uh, that since cannabis is the Orphic drug, it's associated with the goddess, and, and then in the patriarchal takeover, of course, it was one of the things that was knocked from the pedestal along with chaos and the goddess. But even now in this modern society where we have no recourse to these old myths and people are not really afraid of the goddess re-emerging, there's this incredibly expensive drug war going on. Uh, people are not speaking of cannabis now, I think, because the atmosphere for it is most, much more hostile today than even ten years ago. Ten years ago, I used to speak about my experience with psychedelics in class. Now, I wouldn't. It's better not to. Not because the police are going to come and carry me away, but the immediate reaction of these people I'm trying to communicate with is going to be very, very negative. More negative than if I... W was alcoholic and, and put in jail for driving while intoxicated. <clears throat> so the uh, some kind of paranoia about whatever cannabis represents to people, the significance in the mythological, this paranoia is on the increase in this decade, and I wonder why, why you think that is. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> first may I say that uh, <clears throat> I think this paranoia is somewhat polarized and that uh, there is a rising paranoia in the United States uh, which has partly been exported to countries like Malaysia. Um, the paranoia about cannabis in, in Europe is definitely on the decline. Cannabis has been effectively decriminalized in Holland, in Switzerland, in Italy. Um, even in Britain, even in the Thatcher regime, um, the 
uh, there was an article recently in the newspapers um, saying that something like 90% of the people the police catch with small amounts of cannabis are now let off with a caution, not even fined. In Italy, the possession of small quantities of cannabis is uh, not a criminal offence, and even somewhat slightly larger ones is treated on a par with parking offences. You know, you get a ticket or something, minor fines. Um, and the movement, even in Britain, which is probably the most closest to America in its history, in, in general attitudes in Europe, um, there's been a progressive attitude on the part of the police, and even increasing numbers of legislators and judges, towards decriminalizing the use of cannabis. De facto, in small quantities, this has actually happened. So, rather than zero tolerance being the rule, there's in fact been an increasing tolerance in most European societies to the use of cannabis over the last decade. Um, and full-scale legalization may not yet have come, but um, this has happened de facto in various parts of Europe. In the streets of Zurich, for example, where you can sit in the street at cafes and smoke openly, there are certain streets where it's tolerated, unwritten agreements. There are parts of Amsterdam where it's sold le over the counter in cafes, even advertised different brands of it. There are cards up with prices on public display. Um, so, um, there has been a countervailing move in Europe. And so it's not as if this hysteria is gripped everywhere equally. Then we'll be seeing the um, increase of novelty and uh, cultural evolution in Europe, outstripping developments in the United States, according to our well, to some benefits. It yeah. may in fact be happening. I mean, I certainly feel much more at the center of novelty when I'm in Germany, where, by the way, people smoke cannabis in restaurants and uh, uh, quite openly. The United States seems to be on a kind of fundamentalist religious bender that carry it, and its attitude toward women's reproductive rights and drugs and all these things that is making us a kind of pariah in the first world. I mean, we represent values which are incomprehensible to educated Europeans. One thing that occurs to me that I'm sure Rupert would have enthusiasm for because it involves his grassroots science thing, this question of does it make you lazy, does it give you energy, does it destroy your memory, does it enhance your memory? Mm, because yeah. I've smoked so many years, so many different kinds of dope, uh, of cannabis, I've tend, I've come to hold pretty strong opinions about its various forms. And I think that, number one, charas is a debilitating drug. It has opium in it, it has detura in it, and it has various additives and binders that are not good. Mm. Uh, marijuana, which is how most Americans smoke their uh, cannabis, involves the incineration of too much inert vegetable material so that you are getting pesticide residues, mm. carbon monoxide, tars, all of these things are complicating the question of what does cannabis do. And to my mind, the true test of whether or not cannabis is a, what the pharmacological effects of cannabis are, we should almost restrict our discussion to high-grade Lebanese hashish which is truly nothing but the compressed resin of the female cannabis plant. And that's the classical uh, hashish of the Arab, and that's what I prefer and feel almost to be a different drug from both uh, Mexican marijuana and Pakistani or Indian hashish. Those things do carry... Uh, uh, detrimental uh, uh, qualities that are not present in the pure, for instance, three lion or so-called red Lebanese hashish. That's the hashish 
that we want. That's the cannabis product that I would feel is the one that everyone should smoke before they judge or form a strong opinion about what cannabis can do. In spite of the in increasingly repressive atmosphere in the United States, I imagine that marijuana smoking is still on the increase. I mean, it's very widely used, at, at least uh, secretly. They claim not, but... There's a decrease? Slow, in slight. Tonnage? Yeah, they claim so. It's still, it's widespread, sufficiently widespread that a certain amount of grassroots scientific experimentation could be going on if there was a way to share the results of the experiments. Yes, this is something that grassroots, no pun intended, grassroots science could uh, tell us is the relative benignity of various forms of, uh, of hashish or of cannabis. Indeed, yes. I mean, it would be a fairly easy project to carry out. I mean, assuming people had access to supplies of which they could compare. Mm -hmm. There used to be testing labs available. I don't know if they still are on the streets in Berkeley or San Francisco, for example. You could take your specimen of hashish and find out if it was opiated or not. Yes, that is a simple test, but questions about tars, pesticide residues, carbon monoxide uh, output, the various methods of smoking. Well, you'd have to have a revival of kitchen chemistry, as it were. Right. But um, I think that uh, pure, the pure resin of the cannabis plant is... Uh, you would be hard-pressed to design a drug uh, with as many uh, laudable qualities as that one. Mm. Mm, so then perhaps we should consider what would happen if the trend that's happening in Europe anyway continues, if cannabis is yes. actually legalized, which is, as I say, it's already de facto legalized in parts of Germany, Switzerland, Italy, even to an extent in Britain. Um, so what would happen? I mean, I, it's not a prospect I actually ever relished because um, I then imagine you know Philip Morris and, yes and um, you know Anglo-American Tobacco Corporation moving into this area and you know there's no doubt the restrictions on their commercials but um, the idea that this could then be a mass marketed product large-scale international corporations would be in on it BCCI <coughs> um, well There'd be uh, the main high street banks and, and, and so on would then be financing these deals rather than uh, they'd take over the role of BCCI quite legally. Yes. Um, I'm not sure that I particularly uh, relish that. And the other issue which we haven't talked about, which is no doubt of some concern to, to you, Terence, is you know, at what age children might be permitted or encouraged to experiment with cannabis. And, would we want this to be going on in, in, in the gazebo here in Essendon, in nursery schools, you know, junior high school? Um, you know, if it's legalized and much more readily available, the same questions would arise as arise already, but more so because it would be more available. Well, I, I prefer decriminalization rather than legalization. I don't think we need to uh, simply say that any entrepreneur can invest in land, plant cannabis, patent a brand name and begin to sell it on the open market. It would be much better simply to decriminalize it so that, and say something like, uh, each person could possess ten plants but that the transport and sale of it would be discouraged in some way so that it isn't... You see, we seem to have the attitude that something is either illegal or we can just go gung-ho with it and turn it into a meg the product of a multi-million dollar corporation. It would be much better to just say that the possession of small amounts of cannabis for personal use pose no threat to society and leave it at that. Well, how are you going to get your red Lebanese then? 
Well, you would uh, find a way, just as one mm -hmm. finds a way today. Here, if there was a government hack shop. Yes, uh, although I don't find it difficult to find, to get red Lebanese. The only thing I would hope is that we might get a price break if it were decriminalized. It's currently being sold because it's an illegal commodity. It's being sold at an uh, enormous market for what it costs to produce it. And this might be it's something... It's a very expensive business. Well, uh, why... why we have legal alcohol and so many other things. Why not simply legal so there can be shops, there can be huge industries, and there can be um, gourmet growers using special methods and like wine, you mean? Like wine. Exactly. Well, but then you have these problems, which Rupert what is problems? pointing out. That once more, it's handed over to Madison Avenue to be turned into something where they can't simply say it's available to those who want it. Well, people in downtown New York City are not going to be able to grow eight or ten plants themselves. I was recently in downtown New York City and I examined a pot garden that would have been the envy of any resident of Humboldt County. Well, real estate is expensive. Spare <laughs> <laughs> bedroom with row light bulbs is expensive and that, that, that's all right. But uh, I think why not legalization? What are the problems? Well, probably this would come. And then it would be, as far as the question of children, it would be available, you know, it would be restricted to people below age 18 or something. Right. No, I think ultimately what we're going to have to do is legalize all drugs. Now, a hidden aspect of this is that uh, governments make enormous profits out of the fact that these drugs are illegal. A, a harmless drug like cannabis, the interdiction, eradication, and the mafias which move it are all spun into government policy. I mean, governments have always been and continue to this day to be the major purveyors of drugs worldwide. So really, another factor mitigating the drive to legalize cannabis is where then would the CIA uh, obtain, it would eat into its ability to finance the various uh, rebel armies, front organizations. Yes, but what other way? I mean, for instance, when the mullahs took over in Iran, and gained control of the Iranian opium trade, the CIA turned to cocaine and brought on the crack epidemic of the 1980s. So governments will turn to, would the government then create new synthetic drugs like ice and then peddle them to the public? No doubt. Well, this is just something to realize that governments, you see, that anyway. wrap themselves in a mantle of righteousness and tell us just say no. But in fact, governments are making millions off the illicit, billions off the illicit drug trade. The entire Mujahideen resistance to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan was financed with the connivance of the CIA. Hashish was being unloaded on the docks of San Francisco in broad daylight by the metric ton at the height of the Afghan war. We've never been able to get Afghani hash of such quality as we were able to get during the period when the CIA was keen that we buy it so that they could finance the armed resistance to the Soviet occupation. And the day the Russians left, the hashish market in Northern California collapsed catastrophically and has never been able to build itself back to previous uh, levels. Well, Jones has said the more it's organized, the easier it is to steal. See, the more substances are controlled, the more shadow space there is for shadow governments, uh, CIAs, mafias, and so on, to operate in the dark. So it's better to let go on all these fronts. And it's happening in Europe, uh, especially 
I think, uh, is much more significant than the decriminalization of, of, of heroin. There in the same parks in Switzerland you see people sharing needles and so on. I think that's a very courageous experiment and we'll get to see the results and eventually perhaps it will spread to the United States. But, but you wouldn't suggest that we make heroin so legal that uh, you can flip open Time magazine to a color ad that says, what's missing in your life? Heroin, the drug of choice of the chic young set. This is not what we want. Uh, that would yeah. perhaps not be worse than what we've got now. I think that I, I feel as badly about tobacco as I do of, of many of these other things. I mean, personally, I had a very negative experience with uh, free-based cocaine. I found this material to be um, very surprisingly addictive. You know, the tiniest experiment leaves you a total addict. So, in my personal view, this stuff is extremely evil. Nevertheless, I don't think that. Uh, Restricting it by law is an effective strategy to prevent people from getting addicted. I think that crack is similar, I'm not sure. It's uh, extremely toxic material in society, but simply making it illegal just uh, creates this huge uh, shadow trade where it's out of control and people have to experiment here to find out what it is. And so the, the ad uh, in Time magazine would without doubt say this material is harmful to your health. The Surgeon General has found that shooting heroin is harmful to your health. It's liable to be very addicting after a single experience. Um, and so on. The information would be circulated, the shadow would be eliminated, the secret would be eliminated. And I don't think that that necessarily means that a lot more people would be addicted. I think probably fewer. Well, the drug issue brings up the question of whether societies should organize themselves along the assumption that citizens are adults or children. And if you view citizens as children, well, then you have to keep various things out of their hands. If you believe citizens are adults, then you have to believe that certain checks and balances will keep any negative practice from simply sweeping through society and destroying it. I believe that. I believe that if heroin were legalized, a very small number of people would destroy themselves with it, and that's their business, and society can absorb the cost of their slow suicide in the same way that we absorb the cost of the slow suicide that people undergo with tobacco and alcohol. See, here are some more questions for grassroots science. Yes, well, in this drug area, grassroots science could do amazing there, things. It can, can be, uh, it's just that the science. questions are never asked by big science because it really doesn't want the answers to some of these questions. To my mind, the Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness Clause of the United States Bill of Rights, if it means anything, it must mean the right to experiment with psychoactive drugs as you personally see fit. What does Pursuit of Happiness mean otherwise? <clears throat> Nevertheless, there, is, there are these enormous and growing problems of cocaine and uh, heroin abuse are problems that no one seems to have an answer to, and which seems to be far worse than problems in the past. Well, I think it's a red herring. I think that if governments would stop dealing these drugs, these dis problems would disappear. I mean, the I entire... I the night here, the mafia and the, the general Noriegos and the Medellin cartels of this world, I think it'd carry on perfectly well without the help of the CIA. Yes. I think if the CIA told them that they would be highly at risk if they disobeyed orders and that a directive had just come down from the uh, top that this was no longer going to be tolerated. I mean, the, much of the American cocaine comes in on Air Force planes. If you simply deny them the use of the American Air Force, 
it would pose a major problem to them in moving not their... not Super Bowl run. They've got other methods, boats, trucks across the Mexican border, all sorts of things. Well, you're not, going to, you're not going to wipe it out, but you, can, you don't have to grease the slides for it. This is what the CIA is doing. But I think the experiments going on now with the decriminalization mm -hmm. of heroin, which is similar to uh, crack cocaine, I think, in its uh, addictive power, they are very encouraging that um, method other than le legal restriction could be successful in dealing with the crack problem. Well, for instance, take uh, the tropanes. I mean, these are powerful, mind-altering drugs, cause visions, so forth and so on. Uh, the entire Western United States is uh, a, a range for the Jimson weed plant, and it poses no social problems whatsoever to anyone. And it's as powerful as any drug which exists. And no... It just is not a problem. So it's something about focus and glamour, glamorization of habits. Uh, there are a number of examples like this uh, where, well, opium poppies, for example. The garden here at Esalen has a wonderful stand of opium poppies. This is not doing anybody any harm, and I don't see uh, people availing themselves of the raw opium which is being shed copiously just three steps off the path as you walk to the dining room. It's actually the legal restraint that raises the price that creates this um, economic attraction for the illegal substances. So the legal restraints actually create the opposite opposite effect than they're designed for. Yes, hemp was a major crop in this country up until the 1930s, and it was not discontinued because of the drug uh, potential, but because it uh, posed problems for um, those corporate entities which had huge holdings in forest timber that they plan to turn into paper, and the DuPont Chemical Corporation, and Standard Oil, which wanted lubricants and uh, high petrol distillates to come from petroleum rather than from a biological source. So it's, it's simply the glamorization and restriction of these things which creates artificial markets. I mean, airplane glue is an excellent example here. <laughs> airplane glue costs a buck twenty-nine a tube. Powerful drug, hallucinogenic drug, enhances sex, great drug. Only mad people uh, avail themselves of airplane glue. If you were to drop the price of crack cocaine to a buck twenty-nine a gram, you wouldn't see people driving around in their Maseratis with crack cocaine crumbs in their, I mean, with airplane glue in their beards. No, it would, it would be viewed as so déclassé that no respectable person would get near it. Well, now that we've got the legalization of cannabis and probably other things and the resurrection of the hemp industry worldwide. How can we bring this to a conclusion? Well, I think you just did, Ralph. There you have it. Part of the pursuit of human freedom, part of citizenship and responsible adulthood and responsible government means uh, live and let live. This is a philosophy of which we hear far too little. Somebody is always trying to mess with somebody else's life, their sex life, their drug habits, their uh, political stances, so forth and so Long on. Long live orphism. Hear, hear. Hear. Boom, Shiva, boom, Shankar. Okay, gang.